Good morning and welcome to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. I'm your pharmacist, Paul White. We're glad you joined us. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Altman Health Systems, Studio Arts and Glass, and Genu Appraisals and Liquidations. Today, Brad and I are broadcasting from our administrative offices, and our special guest is Dr. Kareshi, cardiologist at Altman Dubal Heart and Vascular Hospital and Cardiovascular Consultants. Good morning, Dr. Kareshi, and welcome morning. to the show. Thank you. Thank you. February is American Heart Month. Why do we observe American Heart Month every February? Well, every year, more than 600,000 Americans die from heart disease. The number one cause of deaths for most groups, heart disease affects all ages, genders, and ethnicities. Risk factors include high cholesterol, high blood pressure, smoking, diabetes, and excessive alcohol use. This year's Heart Month theme is Take Up a Healthy Habit. You can pick a new health heart healthy habit by like jogging or substituting sodas with water and try to stick with it for a whole month. But I'd like to challenge you to a very important heart health habit. Understand your medication and take it as prescribed. You know that nationally, only about 30% of patients take their blood pressure medications correctly. If you schedule, if you struggle with taking your medications correctly, let us help you manage your medication refills and pack them in individual dose packets to help you follow one of the most important health habits, taking your medication correctly. We'd like to remind our listeners that today's program is available on our podcast. You can download that from the App Store in your favorite mm -hmm. smartphone app. Mm -hmm. Just look for Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy, and please subscribe to our programs. So, Dr. Koreshi, welcome again to the show. Uh, please introduce yourself and tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your responsibilities at Altman Dubal Heart and Vascular Hospital. So my name is Atal Krashi. I'm a cardiologist here. I work in the heart failure side of things. Uh, my specialty is congestive heart failure, and I run the CHF clinic here, uh, and responsibilities are linked to congestive heart failure primarily. So uh, my background, uh, I was trained up in uh, Cook County, Chicago uh, for medicine, medicine residency, and uh, did my fellowship in Lehigh Valley Hospital in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Then I did a heart failure fellowship one year at uh, Westchester Medical Center in uh, Valhalla, New York. So that's kind of my training. And I've been here three and a half years or so. Gosh, you've been everywhere. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Um, so what are the common conditions you treat at Altman? So in general at Altman, we provide a pretty wide spectrum of cardiology care uh, short of uh, open heart, LVAD, or transplantation. We uh, provide uh, a full spectrum of uh, cardiovascular procedures and, uh, you know, clinical care. My particular side of things uh, is congestive heart failure. So I'm primarily focused on people, patients who are having uh, that problem. So as I said, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty broad spectrum, including procedures and everything else that we can think of, short of a couple of things like transplantation and an LVAD pump. So, so you're especially in cardiology. Um, do, do you do surgery too? or? So no, no cardiovascular uh, surgery would be done by surgeons. So we are, we are on the cardiology side, we are on the medical side. So we do procedures uh, like heart catheterization is a common procedure that is done uh, here. And, uh, you know, uh, other procedures include TAVR, which is a valve replacement in the aortic position. Um, some other procedures include mitra clip and watchmans. So uh, as far as uh, open heart surgery is concerned, those are done by the surgical, surgical specialists. So not us. How many cardiologists are, are in the department now? So we have around 20 cardiologists uh, from uh, subspecialties and some nurse practitioners and physician assistants uh, along with them. So, hmm. yeah. That's, that's amazing. Um, so uh, any other specialty uh, heart issues that you treat? So I treat, uh, in addition to uh, heart failure, I do also practice general cardiology which includes pretty much a wide spectrum of uh, cardiac care, um, cardiovascular pathology. So that is particularly, that is, those are two things I would do, general cardiology and congestive heart failure. I have some other partners that do interventional or electrophysiology uh, care, and I have a bunch of general cardiology colleagues as well. 
and some of them are focused on cardiac imaging and other various uh, interests that they have. So, you know, that's kind of where we are. Is there, is there any connection? Is it, okay, so we have a new cancer center down there, Robin. Is there any connection between the new cancer center and in cardiology? Yeah, so cardiology, there are certain partners uh, that we have that uh, they're interested in cardio oncology, which is an upcoming uh, field where, uh, you know, patients who are going through cancer treatment uh, and they have side effects related to chemotherapy, uh, cardiac side effects, or interaction between the heart and, and cancer. So they focus on that. And in fact, uh, there are certain programs in the country that offer a fellowship in that kind of uh, you know, site. So we have a, uh, you know, some cardiologists in our practice that are focused on that part, collaborating with the cancer uh, team. So. Doctor, you mentioned that one of your specialties is congestive heart failure. Can you describe what congestive heart failure is for the listeners and, and help us break it down so it's easy for the, the non-clinically inclined to understand? So we got to remember that heart is a pump. Heart is supposed to pump blood. When the heart becomes inefficient in get doing its job, some of that blood may accumulate in places where it's not supposed to be. And you may start noticing some water. Water is an important component of blood. Some of that fluid may start building up in your legs, or you may start noticing some shortness of breath because that is building up in your lungs, uh, or you may start waking up short of breath at night. So some of those symptoms may actually mean that you're holding onto water, and, and then those may be signs of congestive heart failure. So weight gain is another common one. Uh, you eat uh, something which is salty, and next thing you know, your weight has gone up, and you're getting more short of breath. Uh, you may want to talk to your provider, your doctor, or cardiologist regarding those symptoms as they may be related to congestive heart failure. Can you give us some idea of, I'm guessing that there's some health conditions that can lead to congestive heart failure? Right. So, yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting uh, that, uh, the you know, it's a spectrum. Heart failure is a spectrum and you can describe them in, in stages. Uh, you know. Stage A is people who are at risk with certain, you know, behavioral things like we're eating unhealthy or obese and those kind of things. Stage B is when they develop structural problems in the heart. They haven't really manifested with symptoms yet. Stage C is our majority of patients who have developed some kind of a weakness or thickness of the heart or some other valve problems. And stage D is the end stage. So we talk about what leads to these stages and what leads to the development of it in the first place. Common things would be high blood pressure is one of the common reasons. Uncontrolled blood pressure can lead to thickness of the heart muscle and weakness. Another really common reason is uh, blockages in the arteries of the heart. That is in fact uh, one of the most common. And when we see a heart failure patient, that's one of the things that we think as the first thing, is this, is this uh, from a blockage or a heart attack or some decreased blood flow to the muscle. Other things could be rhythm-related problems. Atrial fibrillation is a very common rhythm, which can be linked to congestive heart failure. And so many other viral infections uh, can lead mm. to that. So uh, plenty of reasons for, for it. I mean, just to name a few. All those sound interesting, and you're painting pictures of different uh, patient types in my mind. Who, who, who's typically at risk for heart failure? So it's an interesting question. I mean, if you look at the heart failure, there, there are two types of heart failure. A heart failure where the heart pump function is normal, is squeezing normally. And the other type where the heart is, you know, is weak, it just doesn't squeeze uh, normally. It, the, the heart's so-called ejection fraction is less than 50%. A normal range is between 50 and 70%. That's on a picture of the heart, how the heart squeezes is normally between 50 and 70. So you could be either with a heart ejection fraction between 50 and 70 or less than 50. In people who are less than uh, 50%, the poster child would be a middle-aged man from related to a blockage in the arteries of the heart or, or a history of heart attack. And in, in patients who have a normal ejection fraction, the poster child could be uh, some uh, like a middle-aged lady or older lady with normal squeezing function, but just a really stiff heart. So who is at risk would be, depending on the demographics, as we said, be 
middle-aged man related to blockage or or like an older patient uh, lady related to those are the uh, obviously there is a spectrum and anybody is at risk for pretty much a lot of different things so we can't really say this group is not at risk for that there is certainly a lot of overlap between different pathologies all right so at the top of the program we talked about uh picking up a heart healthy habit for february um, I'm guessing that you have some recommendations for all of us to prevent as best we can heart failure and cardiac disease in general. Yeah, I think that one of the biggest thing is to make sure that we are eating healthy. What is going in our bodies is is healthy. And, and I think staying away from things like, for example, fast food, which has a lot of salt in it, uh, try to keep our waste small okay there is a direct relationship between an obesity around the waist and cardiovascular problems it's called metabolic syndrome mm -hmm. so try to keep our waste uh, you know and cutting down the carbohydrates uh, the, the our staples potato pasta rice sugars the, you cannot lose weight with those kind of things so trying to keep our weight healthy keeping our salt low trying to stay away from excessive restaurant and fast foods and Participating on physical activity around like they say to whatever 150 minutes per week or something of aerobic activity. So those are the few things that we can do what goes through our mouths into our body and what we do to keep ourselves active and what is our waist doing uh, and how much obesity do we have. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay, so what are the common signs of heart failure and are they the same for men and women. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about this. So one of the common signs could be just shortness of breath, I'm not able to breathe. So somebody comes into a cardiology office saying, I can't breathe. That's one of the things to look for. Swelling in the legs, hmm. short of breath at night, um, and palpitations could be a sign. Sometimes even having chest tightness or discomfort as you try to do things could be a sign. Um, so, you know, looking at the ankles, make sure they're not swollen. They're swollen could be a sign of just your heart failure. For women and men, could be similar, I would say. I mean, sometimes heart uh, attacks and blockages could be somewhat silent in elderly and in females, especially in diabetics as well. So, you know, may not necessarily feel a chest pain with, with a heart attack. But other than that, symptoms could be very similar. Wow. Okay, doctor, our first break is here. You're listening to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. Welcome back to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. Friends, just a reminder to stop by the pharmacy and talk to a pharmacist about our new Health Matters drug savings program. We want to, we want to help you stay well and save money. Doctor, I, I'd like to jump back to, to the nutrition thing just for a minute. People, yeah. are con people are consuming large quantities of sugar substitutes. Is, is there any cardiac issues with these? Yeah, not necessarily. I think that there was there's some kind of uh, thought whether there could be linked with cancer and other things. I don't think it has been proven as far as I know. I'm not an expert in the field uh, of these substitutes, but um, as far as the heart is concerned, uh, I don't think there's anything that I can think of. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do know that if you eat sugar and you're getting obese and other risk factors are linking uh, getting diabetic, then certainly that will lead to heart problems. So I think we have to be careful uh, with ingesting that. So. Okay. okay. Um, is it more common for women to overlook symptoms than men about heart? Uh, I guess uh, if somebody is did not get a symptom, a uh, classic symptom of, of heart attack, like a chest pain and things along those lines uh, because of being a woman, that could potentially be an issue. I think that it may be rather personality of a given patient or person uh, to not be, uh, uh, you know, um, what you call it, um, concerned about uh, the symptoms. And, you know, it could, it could be, uh, it, so men versus women could be, I, I don't think there'll be a little difference between them, I think, uh, uh, other, otherwise, so. Okay. So a heart attack. Okay. Is it, is it right down the esophagus part of the chest off to the left, off to the right? Usually uh, retrosternal discomfort right in the center of the chest and may feel like heaviness or tightness or pressure 
may go to the arm or the jaw or to the back and may sometimes we even go to the upper part of the stomach and be nauseated or dizzy. So th there, are, there can be patients that may be even sweating, profusely sweating in the be a symptom, so. Why does it go to the jaw? Well, it could be embryologically uh, similar kind of region uh, between the heart and, and the jaw, I guess. Uh, that may be the reason for uh, some of these pains to refer over to different locations because of how the organs originated when mm. human being, being is born, so. Hmm. Interesting. So if someone's experiencing symptoms, what do they do? Well, the best thing is if you're having chest discomfort is not to tough it out, but rather to go to the ER um, immediately because time is muscle. If you have a blockage and you don't go and get prompt attention, you may develop really long-term consequences, which is loss of heart muscle and congestive heart failure. So, uh, or otherwise death and rhythm problems. So best to go to the ER as soon as possible within 10 or 15 minutes of chest discomfort, uh, you know, and if it resolves, then still, I think, promptly getting attention from your cardiologist or your primary care doctor or even the ER would be a go good idea. You know, I, I think one of the one of the disturbing things about a heart attack or not a heart attack is that a lot of people have uh, digestive issues, um, esophageal, that sort of stuff. And it can be um, confused with a heart attack. Uh, I'm wondering how many people show up at the emergency room with with um, digestive issues and think it is a heart attack. Uh, uh, that's a good question. I mean, sometimes uh, the digestive issues can lead to uh, similar discomfort that may actually get relieved by nitroglycerin because nitroglycerin relax the esophageal muscle. So yeah, I mean, I think uh, the problem here is uh, it's like the you know boy who cried wolf. Like you know, you don't know which one is what. So sometimes be safe rather than sorry. And now if you know your body and you already had a heart attack before and you may make a judgment call in that situation, but um, yeah, I think I have to be, have to be careful. <laughs> what, what kind of gets me is people, you know, the, the, the I'm going to study, you know, use the word Mexican, but there's so many Mexican restaurants around now and the, and the foods are so highly seasoned. Uh, yeah. I just wonder how many people <laughs> mistake that uh, stomach issue for a heart attack. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I mean, I think that certainly those two things can go along. That's, uh, you know, they're, they, they can closely resemble each other. But uh, I think that uh, unless you can really be super, you know, unless you can definitely exclude the heart, I don't think that taking any chances of the heart is a good idea. So Sure. Okay. All right. Why don't we talk about uh, hypertension in pregnant women? So hypertension uh, can be a common uh, uh, issue in pregnancy. Uh, it can have a couple of manifestations. One of them is called eclampsia, where it can be associated with seizures and uncontrolled high blood pressure. And the other one is called preeclampsia, where you don't have seizures. The uh, The Treatment is different because certain medications cannot be used in uh, pregnant patients. And for example, ACE inhibitors or ARBs like lisinopril, losartan, one of those common drugs are not utilized. So certain other medications may be necessary, uh, certain beta blockers or uh, methyl dopa or some other drugs that are specifically uh, are slightly safer in or uh, you know, as compared to the conventional medications in pregnant patients. So uh, as far as that is concerned, and you know, as, as I said, it can be really risky because if you are developing seizures along with, uh, you know, with this, I mean, that can be life-threatening. So certainly uh, getting good prenatal uh, and you know, during the pregnancy, seeing your OBGYN and your primary care providers on a regular basis is absolutely crucial to keep an eye on the blood pressure and make sure that you're not having one of these issues. So. So we know smoking is bad for people and causes COPD. Does it also lead to health fa heart failure? Yeah, smoking can lead to heart failure if uh, it leads to a blockage in the arteries of the heart. So we keep talking about blockages and over and over again. 
but if you develop a blockage, you develop a heart attack related to smoking, then you may be left dealing with heart failure, uh, especially if you have a scar in your heart from that heart attack. Uh, then you may be dealing with a heart that is weaker, not able to pump blood. And then you get all of these things talked about, swelling in the legs, waking up short of breath at night, unable to do your things without getting short of breath. So all of the above, and certainly it can all be traced back to smoking. So it comes back to primary prevention, you know. Uh, prevention is better than cure. So I think if you start making a change in your lifestyle, you know, stop eating that fast food, cut down on your waste, cut down on the smoking, start doing the activity, you may not be dealing with all of the uh, problems that can come as part of being a heart patient. So, okay. Do you care to take a moment to comment before our news break on the dangers of vaping versus smoking? So, you know, smoking has so many chemicals, like somebody said, like up to 7,000 chemicals, a lot of chemicals. So uh, long story short, there may be a lot of chemicals in smoking and vaping, you know, it may be somewhere better from that angle, maybe. But but again, you're still taking in substance that is probably, uh, you know, nicotine based or some other chemicals in it. And, you know, we have sometimes seen like really fulminant lung failure, or pulmonary issues from it, even seen people go on a breathing tube uh, after vaping. So overall, I would say, I would discourage this strongly. I would say, don't vape, don't smoke, don't put anything in your body which is not supposed to be in there. First time I saw somebody vaping in a car, the steam comes out of the driver's side like the car's on fire. <laughs> and yeah. I, just, I was like, hey, the car's on fire. <laughs> so anyway, they make too much smoke. Okay. We are at break time, I guess, huh, Brad? Yep. It is the bottom of the hour. Time for the news. Thanks for joining us this morning on Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. What about secondhand smoke? We hear all about secondhand smoke constantly. Uh, yeah, I would still advise against secondhand smoke. I think that, you know, I, um, I think that smoking, vaping, secondhand smoke, all of them can have... Uh, and you know, contribution towards development of cardiovascular disease, in my opinion. So if if somebody who's smoking around you needs to smoke, he probably should not smoke, you know, at the same area so that you're not getting second and smoke. So I advise my patients to uh, avoid that. Uh, many of my patients are really sick and they have underlying lung disease or pulmonary hypertension or heart failure, and they cannot afford to get sicker. Uh, from any st standpoint, whether it comes to direct lam d uh, lung damage from all the carbon and soot and everything else that goes in causing uh, issues there, uh, or the chemicals like nicotine and everything else that is in it. Hmm. How many doctors do you have? A, do, do you have, I think you said 20 some, is that correct? A yeah. Actual, actual physicians or, 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 right. total, or total team? No, that's the, those are the actual physicians. And then we have uh, advanced practice, pro like APPs, uh, nurse practitioners, or uh, physician assistants on top of that. So pretty, uh, pretty robust group. Yeah. OK. What are some of the specialties of, of other physicians? Yeah. I mean, I, I know we have cardiac surgeons, uh, yes. of course. Um, and we've had other cardiologists on the program before from Altman and, and some, just some very interesting things like, well, how they replace a valve, they just crush it and put, it in, you know, yeah. put, put a new one in. And it was just kind of amazing. Uh, in fact, I was, I was talking to a, a, somebody the other day and they said they had a valve replaced and yeah. the patient did not know that the, uh, the valve was left. Uh, and it was just from another facility that, yeah the valve is left in there and crushed. Uh, and I thought that was pretty amazing. Uh, yep. Why doesn't it get in the way? <laughs> I guess the old yeah. one. Yeah. So, you know, uh, some of the other specialists, uh, like uh, interventional cardiology uh, colleagues who do tanks, some of them also do structural heart. We call it structural heart. And we have two providers in our practice that are structural heart. They put these valves in. Uh, called TAVR valves, uh, which go in the aortic position, and and you know the old valve gets crushed and to the side. It's just like a like a bigger bigger stent. You know, it just kind of crushes it to the side. So mm -hmm. if you put a stent in somebody's artery, you also kind of crush those all the gunk and whatever is in it. 
to the side of the walls of the of the blood vessels. Mm-hmm. So yeah, get in the way, just uh, gets replaced by the and, and, and that and that doesn't cause problems later on, or Please. not usually. No, not usually. I mean, uh, hmm. typically everything goes really smoothly, and it's just good as new kind of thing. Hmm. So, and and more surgery is done by laparoscopy technique than it used to be breaking open the entire chest and. Well, um, still, sternotomy is still like cutting open the sternum is still the uh, pretty much the conventional and most common way of doing surgery. There are certain surgeons that not in our uh, system, which can do uh, through mini thoracotomy through the side, like a smaller incision. But majority of surgery done across the country is still uh, through regular sternotomy, cutting open the chest. Okay. Okay. So, huh. yeah, some of the other specialists that I want to mention in our practice are electrophysiology colleagues. Those They deal with the electrical and rhythm part of things. Um, so we have four of them in our practice, which is uh, really, really good. And uh, some of the other ones are uh, imaging doctors. They read MRIs and CAT scans related to the heart. Uh, and then we obviously have general cardiology colleagues, which uh, we cover a pretty wide territory, mm-hmm. go up on an hour from where we are to cover uh, clinics and hospitals and so on. So a pretty diverse and hardworking group uh, when it comes to um, taking care. And I think they all of them do a really good job and they're really invested in their patients. So, Did, did we cover all of the specialties that you do in your practice? Yes. So I'm primarily a congestive heart failure specialist. I do also see general cardiology, which pretty much means can see any cardiology related matter. And if I need to refer over to another specialist like an interventional cardiology guy that needs to stand the patient or somebody needs a valve we talked about or electrical problems mm-hmm. or some other things, then we can refer them uh, to that specialist. Uh, so general, that's what general cardiologist does, it, the full spectrum. If they need to be referred, they will. Otherwise, they will continue to treat the patient. So I, I ask this question of every, of every cardiologist we've had on the program over the years. We have been on the air for 13 years now. And um, where are we in? heart transplants? So a heart transplant uh, has changed a little bit recently in the in the last few couple of two or three years. The transplantation, uh, the way we allocate or has changed. So previously, there was a, a, a criteria that was, uh, you know, we were listing them as 1A, 1B, status 2, that kind of, that was the previous uh, listing criteria now is uh, status one, two, three, up to seven. The way we risk stratify or place sicker patients on the list has improved. So patients who are on ECMO, who are uh, the sickest of the sick on heart lung support, they are now highest up on the list. Previously, in the previous conventional system, somebody who was on ECMO and they all somebody was on balloon pump, which is a smaller pump, they were kind of looked at similarly in a same kind of with the same eye. But with the current system, the sicker you are, the more gadgets and pumps you're requiring, the higher up you will be on the list. And so it is the organs are allocated towards sicker, sicker individuals that need it the most. As far as trying to uh, get the organ over, so you kind of keep in mind that there's a donor, somebody somewhere in the in the country. So you may have to fly over, let's say, to Pennsylvania to get a get a get the heart. So we have uh, certain machines like Transmedics is one of them. Like you put uh, the heart in a machine that can keep it viable for longer. It, mm-hmm. for, so it doesn't get damaged while out of the uh, body of the donor. Mm-hmm. So there are certain uh, improvements there. Uh, heart transplant survival is around 90% plus at one year. And it still is the gold standard for treatment for stage D, which is the advanced heart failure. And... Uh, but, but the heart pumps, which are really getting better, it's like technology. As you know, technology gets better with time. Uh, we can look at smartphones, how they have evolved. So those things are getting better with time. So we have better short-term pumps that are uh, needed to support patients uh, and long-term pumps to help uh, with, with patients who need a heart pump like or, or an LVAD. So those things have also improved and I think they may ultimately catch up with heart transplant. So right. I think that, We'll see how the, how things evolve, but hmm. but but yeah, that's the summary of that. Interesting. You know, building on your 
technologies and advancements. Uh, just thinking back to pharmacy school when I was uh, a student at IU Med Center in Indiana, I did a cardiology rotation and it was fascinating to see how you and your colleagues operated. And to hear you talk about how even now, you know, a cardiologist isn't just a cardiologist. You have all these different levels of specialties because they're so complex and so many nuances to know. Can you talk about the latest advancements and how, is there anything that stands out that's helped you do your job better, more effectively, or diagnose patients better or more effectively? The field has evolved tremendously. I mean, uh, starting off with even diagnostic images like MRI of the heart is now a common practice. We use MRI in addition to just regular ultrasound or echo to define if there's any, any uh, scar in the heart, is there any inflammation in the heart. It gives us an additional imaging diagnostic tool. We certainly have other imaging modalities, CAT scans that are specialized to look at the heart and uh, so on. So, and same is true for interventional field. I mean, they have certain tools. They can look at the blood vessel from inside through an ultrasound or through other, mm. other means. So the diagnostic things have improved significantly. Uh, as far as treatment is concerned in cardiology, that has really been improving. Like we have really game-changing drugs like Secubitril, Valsartan, and things like the Pagliflozin and Pagliflozin that are Jardians and Farsiga as generic a trade name and Entresto. Those medications have really been uh, really helpful, especially the Entresto, I would say, to change the course of our patient's care and take them away from trouble back towards uh, you know, a better situation. So, uh, and I think that other de devices have improved like pacemakers, defibrillators, they have evolved. And we talked a little bit about the heart pump LVADs. We have other devices like cardio MEMS is a device that can be put in and it can transmit somebody's water levels like congestive heart failure patients, uh, volume status remotely to us. And certain ICDs and defibrillators, pacemakers can also transmit that data regarding fluid and water. So it's just wherever you look, whether you look at the diagnostic front or medication front or uh, procedural front or um, so on, there has only been improvement in my opinion. Uh, and it's just evolving for the better, I think, so. Are we at our final break, Brad? <laughs> yeah, we should do it. That's good, okay, okay. You're listening to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. I am your pharmacist, Paul White. Thanks for joining us. Let's get back to the last segment of the show. Okay. All right, doctor. Um, you know, I guess we've been talking a lot about technology and how things change. And i um, kind of wondering, you know, which developments have had the most impact on your patients? I, I mean, I'm thinking that th th it must be endless. I think the one I would say that has the most impact would be medications. I think most of the hearts get better with medications. And if we didn't have these medications, it would be very difficult to manage these patients. Mm -hmm. So things like metropolol, carvedilol, entresto, Jardians, Farsiga, those medications, uh, spironol, lactone, uh, obviously the diuretics, they have the biggest impact on the, in the majority of patients when it comes to congestive heart failure. Uh, when it comes to just general cardiology patients uh, and other patients having heart attacks, putting stents in there has had a great impact. When somebody comes in with a heart attack, that has been a, a game changer for the whole cardiology uh, you know, practice across the country. Uh, so I think uh, that's pretty much what I would say. Now, everything that you can think of will have some impact. Defibrillators, you can say they save a lot of lives, uh, you know, you you know, for uh, pe people that go into rhythm problems related to uh, heart failure. So we, we our, it's our practice to put them in if your squeezing function or ejection fraction is less than 35%, despite being on medications and everything like that. And certain types of defibrillators that put a third lead in there uh, to correct something called a left bundle branch block or a sluggish electricity as it flows through the heart uh, has those, those uh, could have profound impact on patients. So I think that no matter which specialty you look at, you look at heart failure, you look at uh, stenting specialty, electrical specialty, imaging specialty, uh, there are other specialties like congenital, adult congenital and so on. Uh, you, uh, cardio oncology we talked about. 
no matter where you look at, you will certainly find things that are having huge impacts on our patients' lives and making people live longer, feel better. In fact, newly, uh, now uh, we have a drug called Tifamidus, which can help people with uh, patients with cardiac amyloidosis related to a special amyloidosis coming from the liver called transteratin. And we were diagnosed with them a few years ago, but we were not able to treat it. But now that drug is commercially available. So we treat our patients with cardiac amyloidosis uh, with medications as well. So, so yeah, no matter where you look, you'll find something. What do you think based on, you know, I'm sure you've seen a lot in your experience. Are we, are we as a population listening to the recommendations that you're sharing today? Are we trying to eat better as a whole? Are, are we still careless and think we're invincible and then wind up in your office one day because we lived life carefree? I mean, what kind of themes can you leave for our listeners today? And, and, and maybe if, Maybe something you say today has touched them and made them think twice about, you know, like you said, your waist, how big your waist is and your metabolic syndrome and things. And it seems like there's so many things that we need to do proactively. It seems overwhelming at times, but I'm just wondering what your overall takeaway is with the patients you see daily now. Yeah, I think that, you know, cardiovascular disease, uh, the, you know, the pathology is uh, environment, depending on your genetics and environment. Right, you can control your genes. We do see those patients who are relatively healthy, not obese, and they still develop profound triple vessel disease at age 50. And then how did that develop? You know, even though the LDL is not tr too high, but still they develop something. So we don't know everything about how our bodies are and how our genes play a role. But what you can control is in your environment, what you eat, how much exercise you do, whether you smoke or you vape, whether you take care of you, you know, your, your body in those ways. So if, if you don't do that, then yes, then, then you are partially responsible for, for, uh, for, uh, you know, for this kind of thing. So I think that we have to take ownership of our own situation. Now, if you do end up coming, becoming a heart patient or congestive heart failure or other things, then we also see patients who don't wanna follow recommendations. They don't wanna take your medications properly or they don't wanna uh, do other things that are uh, you know, asked of them. So I feel like, you know, the, the, the taking some ownership would be would be the right idea even before uh, you ever develop disease, and certainly after you develop any heart disease. So, a recommendation uh, would be take home message would be is to uh, take care of your body. You know, do the exercise, take your uh, cut down your carbs, cut down on your uh, fast food, uh, and I think try to make healthy lifestyle changes so that you don't run into these problems. If you do end up running into these problems whether it's genetically driven and was not none of your, you know, nothing to do with environment or whatever it was, then I think we just, just be compliant with recommendations of physicians and, and hopefully that will help the situation. So. I think, you know, we do have, I, I'm thinking about a couple patient interactions I've just had in the last week in the pharmacy. And one of them touches home on what you've just said. And, you know, the one patient came in this week and she's a little intimidated because um, she she has some heart conditions and um, there was a new medication that she was put on. And it was interesting talking with the patient because she was reluctant to take the medication. And it wasn't because she didn't believe the doctor. It wasn't because she didn't feel she had a problem. She just didn't want to take one more pill. And, you know, it was one of those things that we, I think we struggle with in the pharmacy and we try to help patients understand that, you know, your doctor has a, or, or prescriber has a wealth of knowledge and they are looking at your situation and trying to help you solve your problem so that you can still go play with your grandkids and you can go walk in the park or you can travel with your spouse. Uh, it's not because they want you to take one more medication, you know, it, it's because they want to try to help you deal with the situation you've got in the best way you can. And um, I guess I would encourage patients listening today, if you don't understand why you're taking a medication, that's what we're here at the pharmacy for. Stop in the medicine center. We can talk to you about your medication, help you understand the why. Um, no doctor is going to give you a medication just because they want you to take another pill. They're trying to help you solve a challenge you're facing. So it is important. Medications that you don't take don't work. And when you go back to the doctor and they see that you're not improving, then they're probably going to give you something else. And if you don't come clean and communicate with your doctor and tell them, 
look, you know, it's, it's expensive. You know, we, we get patients that come in the pharmacy every week. This medication is too expensive. I can't afford it. So I split doses or I take it every other day. Well, that creates another problem for both you and the provider because then the prescriber doesn't know you're you're not exactly compliant. If they think you're taking it as they prescribed it and your blood pressure is still high, then they're concerned and they want to help you solve that. And it, it's a cascade and just keeps rolling. So I would we try say, to be partners on our end for you that way. So no, I appreciate that. I, I would say two brief points there. One of them is for treating a weak heart, ejection fraction less than 50%. Four medications need to be added on to help, and they all have data behind them, which includes Entresto, Lisinopilosartan, one of them, a beta blocker, spironolactone, and Jardians, or Farsiga, one of the SGLT2 inhibitors. So we're not doing it for fun. We're trying to give you the best chance to get your heart better. That's point number one. Point number two, if you go to the pharmacist or pharmacy and you say, hey, you got to pay 400 bucks for this, uh, you know, otherwise we're not going to give you the drug because that's what it costs, then go Talk to your doctor, call your doctor, say, can I get, is there a coupon? Is there anything else available? Talk to your pharmacist, also talk to your doctor and say, hey, I just couldn't afford it. Don't do that. And when you come for the next visit, call them, say, what else is out there? Can you help me? Is there any assistance available through the company or whatever else? Yes. So just keep those two, two, two things in mind that any drug that we're giving, Cardiac cardiology is one of the one of the specialties which has a lot of evidence based base behind everything we do. There's a research trial behind everything that is done. So so there's it's not for fun or a doctor just likes to prescribe drugs. It is for your uh, optimization. If the doctor only gives you one pill, say hey, see you back in a year, he's not doing you justice. Okay, yeah. you get that heart better. All right. Before we wrap up, Dr. Qureshi, I guess I'd like, you know, can you give our listeners one more time your contact information and, and where you practice and, and any other closing comments that you want people to make sure that they are here today from you? Yeah, so our uh, you can contact us in Cardiovascular Con Consultant 330-454-8076. That's our main number. Uh, you can, uh, you know, call us and I think they'll be able to help you with channelizing to whichever provider you want to see. I think that information is also available on the Altman's website uh, regarding various providers that are here, uh, cardiology uh, providers. And uh, I think that uh, we'll be more than happy to help out in any way. So, Excellent. Well, it's been great talking with you today, doctor. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, I guess our to reiterate what we said at the top of the show, you know, pick yourself a heart healthy tip to start here in February. Um, watch that salt and intake and, and get some exercise and, and please see if you don't have a regular physician that you see yearly, please find one. You know, if you need help, stop in the pharmacy, we'll get one. But, you know, you got to talk to your you got to talk to your providers and um, please be don't be afraid to ask questions. Thank I you. Guess. We're out of time, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Dr. Qureshi, thank you very much. Uh, cardiologist at Altman Dual Heart and Vascular Hospital and Cardiovascular Consultants. We would like to remind our listeners, if you suspect you have a medical issue, please contact your healthcare provider. Thanks to our sponsors, Altman Health Systems, Studio Arts and Glass, Genuine Appraisals and Liquidations. As always, we thank you listeners for joining us on Health Matters with the Medicine Center Pharmacy. Have a healthy week, and we'll see you right here again next Friday on News Talk 1480 WHBC. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you, doctor. doctor. Very interesting.